Uh, we're going to pick up uh, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. We sort of uh, have kind of parked uh, here in the passage regarding the judgment seat of Christ. And certainly it is an important issue. So uh, we're going to talk about uh, the judgment seat of Christ. Specifically, we're going to identify the day that Paul is referring to here in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Uh, again, just so that we recognize the context, uh, let's begin reading at verse uh, 9, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 9, For we are laborers together with God, ye are God's husbandry, ye are God's building. Verse 10, According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed, critically, uh, important how he buildeth thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work, by the way, notice, is work singular or plural? Every man's work. There is a tendency among, uh, you know, saints, and they're sincere and so forth, that the judgment seat of Christ is going to be an evaluation of every single work, uh, the works of the believer. But, but please, notice every man's work, singular, the work of building upon the foundation. We've said some things thus far. If you're interested in some of the things we've already covered, uh, please feel free to pick up a CD or a DVD, okay? Verse 13, every man's work, singular, shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it. That's what we're going to focus on this morning. Because it, that's a reference to every man's what? Work. It, the work, shall be revealed by fire. We mentioned last time the fire uh, is reference to God's word. God's word is likened unto a fire. And the fire shall try every man's, here we go again, singular, work of what sort it is. The sort, uh, what kind of work? Is it uh, a building made up of the superior material that Paul has already listed in verse 12, gold, silver, precious stone? Or is it inferior building material that Paul also lists in verse 12, which would be the wood, hay, and stubble, okay? Verse 14, if any man's work, singular, abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. We'll talk about that next time. Verse 15, if any man's work, singular, shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Please, I'll, I'll repeat myself once again, the salvation that verse 15 is talking about is not a reference to soul salvation unto eternal life. The salvation that Paul here in verse 15 is referring to is the salvation that now equips us to be of eternal use in the heavenly places. In other words, this fire at the judgment seat of Christ is intended to save us for God's eternal use. And that's what we want to make abundantly clear. It's not a salvation to determine whether you go to heaven or hell. It's a salvation that God is going to provide to the believer even though your building might burn up, even though your work of edification might suffer loss. God is still going to eternally use the believer, okay? We'll say more about it when we get to that passage uh, some other time, all right? At this rate, it could be in a couple of years, but I'm just kidding, all right? So let's go back now to verse 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest. Here we go. For the day shall declare it, okay? What I wanted to talk about this morning is what day is Paul referring to? And there is, sadly, among Christendom at large, a great deal of confusion regarding the judgment seat of Christ. It's critically important to identify where and when this judgment is going to take place. We can identify in God's Word at least three impending judgments. That is, there are three judgments referred to uh, in the Scripture that are still yet future. At least three judgments, okay? Trying to keep things as simple as possible. And the reason we want to identify 
which judgment Paul is talking about is because you want to prepare for the judgment that we're going to be involved with. Otherwise, you might be preparing for another type of judgment. And if you're preparing for the wrong judgment, uh, you're going to have your work suffer loss. Okay, there's going to be this this burning. So it is important to identify what judgment is Paul talking about. All right. Now, as we read verse 13 again, for every man's work shall be made manifest for the day shall declare it. Drop down to chapter four and let's pick it up at verse three, chapter four and verse three. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self. For I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. But he that judgeth me is the Lord. Verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the time when? Until the Lord come. Now this is where things can get a little confusing. Is the Lord coming back? Absolutely. Uh, by the way, my message during the course of the conference is that the satanic message that is going to be preached during that 70th week of Daniel is that Messiah has not even come, quote, the first time, okay? So when Paul here talks about until the Lord come, what coming is the Apostle Paul talking about? If we fail to rightly divide the word of truth, you are naturally going to gravitate towards a prophetic coming. Okay? And it's traditionally viewed, even among you know, fundamentalists, uh, sadly, you have fundamentalists that will recognize what we call the rapture event. But for some odd reason, they'll go to the book of Matthew and read into, for example, Matthew chapter 24, uh, the rapture. And there are other things that they do in the book of Matthew. So uh, it's critically important to recognize that there is more than just one impending coming. When we rightly divide the word of truth, recognize Paul's unique place and purpose in God's overall plan and certainly his place in scripture we recognize that given to the apostle paul is a system of information regarding a coming which was not prophesied okay if if you allow me just to identify some of the language here on the board okay here we have of course the lord jesus christ who was crucified he was uh, god's anointed he was israel's messiah and and he's uh, crucified in unbelief, okay? And we go through the timeline. There's a period of, uh, of time in early Acts, chapters 1 through 7. What we learn is that uh, the Lord Jesus appears to Saul of Tarsus in Acts chapter 9, and that is an unprophesied appearing. It is an appearing that occurs because of God's dispensing of grace to a Christ-rejecting world. The Gentiles, historically, were already abandoned by Almighty God. So what we learn in Scripture is that God today is dispensing His grace, okay? This dispensation of grace has been uh, going on now for, um, for about 2,000 years, okay? After the end of the dispensation of grace, and we're going to go to the verses here, just bear with me, there is an event that we commonly, commonly refer to as the rapture. The rapture is an event that brings an end to the current dispensation of grace. After the dispensation of grace uh, comes to its conclusion, the prophetic program resumes, okay? And we're not going to get into the weeds here. There's a, a, a period of time uh, that precedes the 70th week of Daniel. Prophetically, 70 weeks are determined for the nation of Israel. 69 weeks have already uh, uh, occurred. There is one remaining week of years. Seven years are left in God's prophetic uh, calendar. That is referred to as the seventh week of Daniel, the time of Jacob's trouble. There's other terms that are used. Uh, we commonly refer it to the seven-year tribulation, okay? Again, that's just some language that is commonly used. After that seventh week, in prophecy, and even the Lord Jesus Christ prepares the little flock for his return back to earth. 
there is a future coming in light of prophetic scripture. And uh, most uh, Christendom, when they talk about the return or the coming of Jesus Christ, they understand it as the coming of Jesus after the 70th week of Daniel. If there is only one more coming uh, in the future, and we don't rightly divide the word of truth, you understand why there are some that would teach that this event that we call the rapture happens after the tribulation. They, of course, uh, uh, understand that the rapture occurs at his coming. But they, by default, assume that the coming, whereby the church is going to be caught up, occurs after the tribulational period. That is a grave error. That's the result of failing to rightly divide the word of truth and recognizing what God has revealed to and through the Apostle Paul. Okay, We're going to go back and say some things about that. Now, keep this in mind. There is going to be a judgment when Jesus Christ comes to establish his kingdom. Okay, So there is going to be a judgment that occurs at the start of the, quote, millennial reign of Jesus Christ, that thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. After that thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ, there's going to be this ultimate battle uh, where uh, the Lord Jesus is, is ultimately, God is ultimately going to consume all of the enemies of Israel, all the enemies of his Christ, so on and so forth. And uh, there will be another judgment called the great white throne judgment. Never ever to be confused with the judgment that Paul is talking about. The judgment that Paul is talking about in that day is exclusively restricted to the church, the body of Christ, all that are saved in the current dispensation of grace. That's the judgment seat of Christ. The language, the label, judgments, J-O-C, judgment seat of Christ is unique to the Apostle Paul and restricted to his epistles. This judgment, the judgment seat of Christ, cannot be confused with another judgment that precedes the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, and it certainly should never ever be confused with the great white throne judgment, where unbelievers are going to be reunited with their dead bodies, and they're going to be ultimately judged, and they're going to be ultimately pitched out there in the lake of fire, and then ultimately the new heaven and the new earth, the dispensation, the fullness of time, so on and so forth, okay? So we're going to try to identify at least three judgments. We're not going to deal with the details of that second judgment, nor the third judgment. What are we concerned with? What is Paul concerned with? the judgment, what we call the judgment seat of Christ. When is that judgment going to take place? And I, I want to reiterate, the judgment seat of Christ that occurs in the day of Christ, C-H is Christ. You know, sometimes we use the, the letter X to represent Christ, and some people really are offended by that, okay? So I'm going to just use the C-H to represent, well, because I didn't have any room, right? Well, the, the judgment seat of Christ occurs in what Paul calls the day of Christ, okay? And let me say this now, and we'll look at some things. The rapture is not the day of Christ, but the rapture happens at the start of the day of Christ. The day of Christ is actually a period of time, okay? I just want to say that in a technical way because some people assume that the day of Christ is the rapture. The rapture is the day of Christ. Be careful. The rapture occurs in the day of Christ, but the day of Christ does span a period of time. All right? That's just a little technical point that I want to make. Now, also on this little timeline is another day, commonly referred to in Scripture, especially in prophecy, as the day of the Lord. Okay? And... And what we need to, to uh, recognize is that the day of the Lord is, is part and parcel of the prophetic program. We're not going to look at the details about the day of the Lord. When did the day of the Lord begin? The Word of God says a great deal about this coming day of the Lord. The, the great 
and notable day of the Lord, the day of vengeance, the day of. So uh, there's there's certain language that is used. What I want to try to do this morning is demonstrate the day of Christ is not the same as the day of the Lord or vice versa. That's why I'm using yellow to represent day of Christ and pink as the day. There are two different days, okay? Um, On the timeline, prophetically, the 70th week of Daniel resumes the day of the Lord. And, and, you know, I'm not going to we're not going to look at, well, does it actually begin in the middle and so on and so forth? All I'm saying is this prophetically, the day of the Lord has already been taught in Scripture. Okay, and in that day of the Lord are some events and activities that span the 70th week of Daniel, the seven year trip. But it also includes what the Lord is doing in his day on earth during the millennium. Okay, so uh, just be mindful that the language day of the Lord is part and parcel of the prophetic program. The day of Christ is a label that we find in Paul's epistles. With that, let's read chapter three, verse 13 again. Every man's work shall be made manifest for the day. That's a reference to the same day that we read about in chapter 4, verse 5. Read verse four, chapter 4, verse 5 again. Therefore, judge nothing before the what? Will there be a time of judgment? Now, if we don't rightly divide the word of truth, and you're careless, and I'm careless with God's word, oh my goodness, is Paul talking about the judgment of the great white throne or the great white throne judgment? You see why we have to identify the different judgments? Because someone could read verse 5, therefore judge nothing before the time, oh no, the great white throne judgment. Are you and I as believers today going to be judged at the great white throne? Well, if you don't rightly divide the word of truth, you might place yourself at that judgment, all right? And boy, there's not a lot of comfort if you're at that judgment, okay? Keep reading verse 5, until the... Lord come. The Apostle Paul says some things about the coming of the Lord. Now, again, without getting into all of the weeds, there are a couple of passages where Paul does refer to the Lord's coming at the end of the tribulation, at the start of the millennium, okay? But when Paul here is talking about this judgment, this judgment that's going to occur in that day, Paul is talking about a judgment that happens in the day of Christ, okay? That's when the body of Christ is going to be judged, okay? And we don't want to confuse it with the other two prophetic-type judgments. Uh, Have I lost anybody yet? (laughs) Nobody wants to admit it. Okay. Let's start all over again. No, we're not going to do that, right? So let's look at what Paul does say about this specific judgment and how it is uh, and and how it is unique to the day of Christ. And it has nothing to do with the judgment that occurs at the start of the millennium and certainly has nothing to do with the great white throne judgment. Okay, Um, how about we go to. 2 Timothy. Let's go to 2 Timothy and let's talk about the fact. By the way, we, are we going to be judged? I'll tell you what, before you go there, let's go to Romans chapter. There are three primary passages, three main passages. Go to Romans chapter 14, where Paul tells us as members of the church, the body of Christ, that we do face a judgment. Again, it's not a judgment to ascertain whether or not you're going to heaven. Why is a believer secure in his or her knowledge and understanding that they're going to heaven. We're going to heaven because of the grace of Almighty God bestowed upon the believer today through the shed blood of Jesus Christ, okay? We are eternally secure. We are sealed, okay? And we're going to go to that passage. We are sealed until the day of redemption. We'll talk about that. So here's my point. Whatever judgment Paul's talking about in relationship to the believer is not to determine whether you go to heaven. Heaven is already a reality for the believer, okay? That's the assurance that God gives to us. And there are many passages that teach the eternal security of the believer. But will the believer be judged? Yes, 
will, and, and, and is God going to judge all of our sins at the judgment seat of Christ? That would be called double jeopardy. Have all of your sins already been judged? Absolutely. And thank God your sins have already been judged. That's what happened at the altar of Calvary. All of our sins as believers, okay, we're not going to talk about on on the pond, but as believers, when we trusted Jesus Christ as our Savior, relying exclusively on, on the blood that He richly shed as His Father's propitiation. This is what's so marvelous about Calvary. Brother Ted Fellows, by, by the way, Matt uh, Hawley, Last Sunday during Sunday school, he taught a wonderful lesson on tribulation. He laid out five points regarding how a believer today needs to understand uh, regarding the tribulation, right? Uh, not the, but tribulation in life. Brother Ted Fellows, uh, he taught a lesson out of Genesis chapter 22. And what he did was he demonstrated some things about, you know, when Abraham was going to offer up Isaac, right? What a beautiful shadow. Of, of God as a father who is going to provide the sacrifice for the believer. Isn't it interesting that God did instruct Abraham, Abraham, you take your only son. Question, did Abraham have another son besides Isaac? What was his name? And wasn't he the older son? Who was uh, Abraham's first son physically? Ishmael. Why did God say to Abraham, take your only son? Now, who is the only son in the sight of God? Isaac. Who is the only son in the sight of God? So, so you've got to appreciate the shadow and the type here. So what we have is, as God instructed Abraham, and he said, the Lord shall provide. God the Father personally provided a sacrifice for Himself to assuage and to appease His offended justice. You talk about God's grace. When God says, I will give you eternal life because of my grace, God in His grace is the one who offered to Himself the only acceptable sacrifice. Listen, you and I could never have even dreamed of, of coming up with a satisfying sacrifice to appease the offended justice of God. God in His own grace, He's the one who actually provides a sacrifice for Himself. And you know who that sacrifice is? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus Christ is called the propitiation. God satisfied His own personal outrage against your sin. By turning to his son and killing him. Putting him on that cross to die the horrific death called the second death. I'll tell you, salvation has nothing to do with you being a good little boy or a good little girl. It has nothing to do with what you're doing in your life. Salvation, Christianity, is about a person. Christ is the focus of, quote, Christianity. Salvation, true Bible Christianity, centers around all that the Father and the Son did for the believer. A, 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 an exchange took place back there 2,000 years ago where Jesus said, I'll take the place of the sinner. And God the Father honored the will of His Son to do that. God looks at his son and he says, that's my propitiation. God provided it on your behalf. You understand why God can never accept your own human effort and merit to try to get to heaven? If God the Father says, but I already provided the blood sacrifice on your behalf, what in the world could we ever add to it? All we would do is mess it up. So, now I know I'm getting a little sidetracked here, but please keep this in mind. God the Father already judged all of your sins, past, present, and future. We're not going to experience double jeopardy at the judgment seat of Christ. 
The judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment where God is going to whip out that record book and begin to rehash and rehearse and revisit every sin and trespass and iniquity and evil. and Why? Already judged. By who? The Lord Jesus Christ. So the judgment seat of Christ is not a judgment that focuses on your or my sins. It was already dealt with at Calvary, okay? But there is a judgment. Now, this judgment can strike terror in the heart of the believer, or we can relax a little bit and learn about what this judgment is and begin to address the issues of life in relationship to this type of judgment, okay? Now, Romans chapter 14, here we have um, uh, a passage that refers to the judgment seat of Christ, okay? We're in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Obviously, there is a judgment that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Well, notice here in Romans chapter 14 and um, verse 10. Romans chapter 14, verse 10. Why, but why dost thou judge thy brother? Remember what Paul said? Judge nothing before the what? Time. You know that Paul, I know, now I'm kind of, Ahead in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the Corinthians are judging Paul. Paul says, I'm not going to let you do that. So, so just appreciate what Paul here is doing here in verse 10. But why dost thou judge thy brother? Do you have a capacity to adequately, righteously judge what your brother in Christ is doing or not doing? Now, walk, tread lightly. Okay, tread very lightly here. Do you or I have the right to occupy the judgment seat of Christ? You know why? I, I can't do it righteously. The Corinthians are unrighteously judging some things about Paul. And Paul's the one who says, judge nothing before the time when the Lord shall what? The Apostle Paul says, I reserve my right to be judged by the righteous judge, the righteous one. And it's going to be in his time, his day, when he comes, that I now I'm going to prepare for. Verse 10, why dost thou judge thy brother? Or why dost thou set it not thy brother? Now here's the end of verse 10. For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Never confuse it with the great white throne judgment. And, and I hope we demonstrate, don't confuse it with another judgment preceding the millennial reign of Jesus Christ, okay? Verse 11, for it is written, as I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. Verse 12, so then every one of us shall confess all of his sins. No, shall give account of himself to God. Now, there's an illustration of that in Job chapter 1. We're not going to go there. Do you know that Satan himself gave account of his activities in the universe, in his fallen state before God Almighty? Listen, God is a God who expects his creature to give account. So we as members of the body of Christ, we're going to give account. Please. Oh, no. I got to stop. Why did I commit that sin? Why did I have that evil thought? But be careful. That is not what's going to happen here, okay? Why isn't God, and please take this the right way. Why isn't God that interested in your sins <laughs> in the future? Already paid for fully through Jesus Christ. Always remember that, okay? And then one more passage, 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We have here another passage making reference to the judgment seat of Christ. Now, some people ask, well, Paul, Paul mentions the judgment seat in Romans chapter 14. He's making reference to it in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. And then Paul makes, uh, says some things about it in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So there are three passages that address the judgment seat of Christ. And the question is, well, why three times? Now, three, of course, is a significant number in God's word. And uh, perhaps when we talk about the reward, we know something about the anatomy of a man, a believer, spirit, soul, and body, correct? I find it interesting that 
these three passages referring to the judgment seat of Christ appear to correlate to the three realms that make up your anatomy, spirit, soul, and body. And uh, we, we recognize some things about the operation of God, the operation of the Word of God in the hands of the Holy Spirit in the realm of the spirit, think like God, in the realm of the soul, live like the Lord Jesus, and in the realm of our physical bodies, laboring together with the Holy Spirit. For example, look here in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. Wherefore, we labor that, whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. Verse 10, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Okay, there's an appointment already scheduled. We're all going to stand. And we're all going to appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Now, notice what Paul says in verse 10, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it, we, it, whether it be good or bad. Okay. Now, Paul's going to provide some information about uh, the, the content, uh, the context of, of why it is we're appearing before the judgment seat. Okay. Okay. That's not the scope of what we're doing. What I want to do is identify the day. Now go to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. And um, there are passages where Paul uh, is preparing the believer today for a specific judgment unique to the system of revelation, unique to the system of information that was given to Paul. Uh, there's this, this special Unprophesied judgment unique to the day of Christ. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Okay, number one, is there going to be a judgment? When is this judgment going to take place according to verse 1? At his appearing and his kingdom. Now, years ago, I taught these two events as two separate events, that there's a separation between his appearing and his kingdom. But let's be careful. Drop down to verse 8. Verse 8, Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at when? That day. Paul's, there you, you see that, that day again? What did Paul call it in 1 Corinthians 3, verse 13? The day shall declare it. What did he say in chapter 4, verse 5? Judge nothing before the time until the Lord, what? Come. Here he talks about the righteous judge shall give me at that day. Will Paul be judged in that day? Absolutely. Now Paul's referring to uh, a crown of righteousness, right? Which the Lord, the righteous judge. You see why it's critically important? Don't go around judging everybody's edification. Now, we certainly in love can evaluate where people are at. And again, Romans 14 provides all this information about, hey, the weaker brother and the stronger brother and the stronger brother has no right to exercise his rights to the spiritual detriment of the weaker brother. You have no, listen, you have no right to sacrifice your liberty, but you're at liberty to sacrifice your rights. And so Paul, he's talking about, you know, we, we, we want to help build a believer up, but who ultimately is going to judge the edification? who will ultimately judge the spiritual edifice that the believer is building, whether it's gold, silver, precious stone, or wood, hay, and stubble. Whose function and responsibility is it to judge that? The Lord Jesus. So Paul is pretty confident here. Uh, and, and by the way, why is Paul confident in verse 8? Here's a little... Why did Paul say in verse 8, henceforth there is laid up 
for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love his what? Now, be careful. Is Paul saying, I know I'm getting a physical crown? We get, we'll eventually talk about the reward. Paul's not talking. He's not saying, oh, I know there's going to be some physical crown that's going to be given to me, and then like the book of Revelation, I'm going to toss it at the Lord's feet. Okay? Again, failure to rightly divide the word, word of truth can, can uh, uh, come to that conclusion. But, but again, in verse 8, the righteous judge shall give me at that day. Drop down to verse 18. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly what? Kingdom. Go back to verse 1. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his what? Appearing and his what? Kingdom. Is Paul referring to the heavenly kingdom? You see, when we rightly divide the word of truth, we understand, we recognize Paul's unique place in Scripture and the revelation, the system of information that was given to him regarding God's eternal purpose in the heavenly places. Paul calls it the kingdom of his dear son. The word kingdom is a very general term. There's a bunch of kingdoms in the Bible. There is this one overarching kingdom called the kingdom of God. Most people are familiar with the kingdom of heaven on the earth at, at the expense of recognizing, but there is something called the kingdom of his dear son, all right? So there is an earthly kingdom that will literally be established on the planet. But there is also a, Paul calls it, what kind of a kingdom? Heavenly kingdom. When Paul talks about the kingdom and our place in the program of Almighty God, Paul never suggests or even intimates for a moment that you and I, as the body of Christ, are participating in the days of heaven where? On earth. Rather, we are destined to participate in the heavenly, that is, the kingdom of His dear Son, that involves the occupation of various governmental structures and realms called the heavenly places. Okay, make that distinction. Because there is a judgment destined for those who are going to live on the earth, the days of heaven, the kingdom of heaven on the earth, but there's a judgment for you and I as we're going to be prepared for the heavenly, the, that is, the kingdom of his dear son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, both of those kingdoms operate under this umbrella called the kingdom of God. Uh, we we want to make uh, some distinctions here, okay? But uh, verse 1 again of chapter 4, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his what? Appearing. Now, in, in Paul's epistles, there are, Go to 1 Timothy chapter 6. Paul makes a reference to the appearing of Jesus Christ. And this appearing is a mystery appearing, if you will. Um, obviously, the Lord Jesus did appear there in Acts chapter 9, Saul of Tarsus. But there is an appearing that we are waiting for. 1 Timothy chapter uh, 6 and notice there at verse 14, 1 Timothy chapter 6 and uh, verse 14. That thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the what? Appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which in his times, this appearing is going to happen in, and we'll see a couple of verses, in, in what is called the day of Christ. I'm going to try to link all of this together. He's going to appear in his times. That's the day of Christ. It, 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 it begins with this event that we're going to identify as the rapture. And, and, and there is a special appearing that's going to happen. And that is going to initiate his 
times. Keep that in mind as we look at the day of Christ. In that day, remember that day? That's when the judgment seat of Christ is going to occur. Okay, It's going to occur in his day. Reading verse 14 again, that thou keep this commandment without spot, unrebukable, until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now go to Titus chapter 2, Titus chapter 2, and I'm sure 90% of you know this verse by heart. You should know it. Beautiful verse, powerful verse. Titus chapter 2, verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope, and the glorious, what? Appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. We are looking for, that is, we live our lives centered around this appearing. Paul's going to call it this coming. This coming of who? The Lord Jesus Christ. Go to 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians. And notice in chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And notice what Paul writes here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Chapter 2, verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our what? Gathering together unto Him. This is a unique event exclusive to Paul's epistles. If you go to Matthew 24, don't go there. When the Lord Jesus talks about his appearing out there according to prophecy, he's coming to earth and he's going to gather his elect that are located where? On the earth. And his elect on the earth are going to enter into the kingdom. Paul, when he makes a reference to the appearing of Jesus Christ, which initiates his day, his time. It's the day of Christ. We don't read about him coming to earth, but rather we read about, as Paul describes it, our gathering together where? Onto him. Now go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And, and what Paul is describing is what we commonly refer to as the rapture. Why do I keep having to say? It's almost like, remember Prince? Uh, formerly known as who? Prince. He got rid of his name. I guess legally, he didn't have a name. So then what do you call him? Oh, the performer formerly known as who? Prince. So now he really complicated things, okay? So why is it that, that, that we keep saying uh, we commonly refer to it as the rapture? Why can't we just say rapture? Because some people really flip out. Rapture is not a Bible word. Well, Bible's not a Bible word either. Where do you find the word Bible? In the Bible. So if we're going to be purist, we should say the Scriptures. Okay? Is it okay to say Bible? Are you, are, are you violating and offending God because we talk about the Bible? It just means book, right? We know what we're talking about when we say the book. So if we use the word rapture, Technically, it's not a Bible word. However, the context, cont, uh, the, the, the meaning, and, and the event called the catching up uh, is a, is a, can be used. Rapture simply means to be caught up. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord, I love that. I, I just can't get over that. I just can't go to it. I made, I made a comment about this. Go to chapter 5, verse 9. This, to me, is so tender. It is just so touching. The Lord Jesus Christ, I can't help but think, how personally involved was the Lord Jesus Christ to secure your eternal salvation at Calvary? How personally involved was he? Did he not give himself personally as the Father's propitiation for your sins? How personally involved was Jesus to give you eternal life? You can't get any more personally involved than the Lord Jesus literally experiencing our second death. And we know the horrors of the physical death, but more than just the horror of physical death, the absolute horror of spiritual death. Was he pretty personally involved because he loved you that much? <laughs> 
You know what? He loves you so much. He didn't say, David, you start behaving. He loved David and, and Barb and Paul and Charlotte. You know, he loved us so much. He personally intervened on our behalf. He became our substitute. How personal is that? I think about that when I read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to what? Now, that's the wrath that's going to uh, break out during the course of the 70th week. Okay, I'm not going to look at that, but here's my point, verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath. Okay, that future impending outbreak of God's wrath against the Christ-rejecting nation, against the uh, 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 enemies of the nation of Israel, that wrath, we are not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation. Now, it's not soul salvation. How did we obtain soul salvation? The work of the cross, where Jesus Christ personally intervened for each and every one of us. He was our substitute. But there's another salvation that you and I enjoy. Jesus Christ is personally going to ensure that the body of Christ is saved from the wrath to come. How is Jesus personally involved in guaranteeing that his body, his glorious church, is going to be saved? from impending wrath. Look at the end of verse 9. But to obtain salvation, how? By our Lord Jesus Christ. Now think about that. Yes, we know by the means. Certainly Jesus Christ is the cause and He's the effect. Jesus Christ is the means by which He can ever save us from any and all types of salvation. But when I read verse 9, I understand it based upon chapter 4. In other words, this is the way I would read verse 9. For God hath not appointed us to, to wrath, but to obtain salvation from that wrath by our Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ is personally doing something to assure His glorious body, you're not going to go through that time of wrath. You know how He's personally intervening? Chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord himself gosh he loved us from the beginning he loved us before the creation of the world the apostle paul tells us he loved us he gave himself who loved me paul says and gave himself for me and that love is so intense and continues to be so personal that he's going to guarantee that not one member of his glorious body is going to accidentally fall into that period of wrath. You know why? He himself, as the verse describes, shall descend from heaven with a what? Man, the heavens are silent right now. Uh, Sir Robert Anderson, if there's a book, there are a number of books that Sir Robert, do you know who Sir Robert Anderson is? You know that he was in charge of Scotland Yard? <laughs> Even during the time of Jack the Ripper, you heard of Jack the Ripper? Anyway, uh, Sir Robert Anderson, he was, um, I'm going to call him chief of police. That's not what they call them there in England. But anyway, he, was, he oversaw Scotland Yard. And um, he, was, uh, he was a forensic in inspector. He was a detective. I mean, he, he led this. But he was also a Bible believer who not only just believed the Bible, he understood some things about right division. And he made the distinction between Israel and the church. And he wrote a book called The Silence of Heaven. Is God, so you just got to appreciate this. For this duration, we call it's the dispensation of the grace of God. God is silent. You know how that silence is going to be broken? Verse 16, for the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a what? That silence is going to break. God is silent because He's a patient God. He's a long-suffering God. He's a merciful God. And He quietly invites the sinner to just come to Him. The work of salvation is a quiet work, isn't it? Oh, it's a violent work. It's quiet because God doesn't want you stirring up the religious dust, kicking up all of the ceremonial activity. See, man is... We're, we're a noisy lot, aren't we? 
We make a lot of noise. The Bible says the prophet, he heard the still, small voice of the Lord. The Lord doesn't go around kicking up dust, may mayhem, and, 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 and rattling the key. You know, God is silent because he's patient. He's patient with you. He's patient with your sins. Now, the cross was an outrage. It was ugly. It was violent. But during this dispensation of grace, God's silent. He's waiting. He's just waiting you for, the, for you to positively, personally respond to his goodness and grace. The giver of eternal life. Man, you don't have to kick any dirt up. You, you rest. You just say, thank you. And you take it. One day, the silence is going to be broken. And it starts when Jesus himself descends. The door of heaven is going to crack open. Who was it uh, during the conference? Uh, oh, I think it was John. I don't know, whoever it was. And you have Michael, the archangel, in Revelation chapter 12, for example. And the verse tells us how Satan, is his, his angels, they fought Michael and his angels. And somebody, the way they described it was kind of neat. Uh, one day, the Lord is going to say, Michael, go for it. And Michael's going to be like, finally. What do you think, what do you think the, the heavenly hosts have been doing for millennia? They're not just floating around R&R. &R. What does a, a standing army do during peacetime? You're always preparing. You're always equipping. You're always perfecting. You're always developing for potential war. You know what Michael and his troops have been doing? For thousands of years? You don't think they're preparing? You don't think they are eagle, eagerly anticipating the day when the heavens are going to experience an outbreak of war like no other? And it isn't going to be Michael caught off, the archangel, it isn't going to be Michael, uh, oh, I, I wasn't prepared. <laughs> oh Lord, are you serious? Now? You better believe. Michael, he's biting at the bit. He can't wait to, to, to uh, 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 rectify the universal outrage that is responsible for Lucifer and his rebellion. You better believe Michael can't wait for the day when the Lord Jesus, that door's going to open up, and the Lord's going to what? Shout, keep reading verse 16, with the voice of the who? By the way, whose voice? With, with the voice of who? You better believe it. I mean, I, I'm just, as soon as that door opens, Lord Jesus is going to yell something, and immediately Michael the archangel, he issues the command and the hosts of heaven. They now rally at the rallying point. And those forces come together with such intense fury, and you talk about a violent battle in the heavens. Revelation says that there was no more place found anymore. You better believe it. These angelic hosts, they're going to go out there and they're going to go through every nook and cranny in the universe, in those heavenly places, and they're going to ensure that every rebellion, every act of rebellion is going to be eradicated out there in the heavenly places. I'm telling you, there's some powerful stuff going here. Keep reading. With the trump of God. Now, does God play a trumpet? Well, with, with the trump of God. Well, there's going to be a trump. By the way, it doesn't say trumpet, does it? What's the difference between a trump and a trumpet? Well, the trumpet is the actual instrument. And what sound does the trumpet make? The trumpet makes a trump sound. Okay, God, there's going to be a sound. And what will this sound of the trumpet do? The end of verse 16, and the dead in Christ shall rise, what? First, that's every dead believer during the duration of the dispensation of the grace of God. And then it gets even better, verse 17, then we, Paul thought he was going to be in it, right? Then we which are alive and remain, here we go, shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. Does it sound like he's coming to earth? 
Does it sound like he's on the earth? If he's on the earth, what is, what's the purpose of this resurrection? And, and what does it mean for those which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them where? See, the description here is not of the prophetic coming when Jesus is literally going to set foot on Mount Olives that's going to split that mountain in half. And Brother Rick Jr., he's out there describing how, how you have Jesus Christ. He's taking the lead stallion. And he's got the reins of that white horse. And as he plows through that whole area of Palestine, the promised land, he is literally slaughtering his enemies. And then, of course, the horses, they're, getting, they're all speckled. And, and you got the blood all over the place. And, and, and it's, it's going to be a horrific event. Listen, prophetically, Jesus is literally coming to the planet. He's going to step down on the earth. He's going to initiate his just wrath against all of the enemies of Israel. And then eventually, Eventually, he ends up there in Jerusalem. There's all sorts of... But you know what? He stays on the earth. And all the elect on the earth are going to be gathered together into that kingdom. Paul describes an event whereby the believers in this dispensation, we're going to be shot out somewhere in the atmosphere. Where? How far? I don't know. But it says, verse 17, We which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord where? In the air. Prophetic events are not occurring in this verse. And so shall we ever be where? That's his day. That's his time. Ephesians, we're going to run a few verses very quickly. Go to Ephesians chapter uh, 4. Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, oh boy, and we're going we're gonna to wind it down here. Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. There is a day in which we are going to be caught up. This is a mystery catching away. This is a mystery appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. It's called the blessed hope, by the way. Blessed, that word means happy. We, we really do have cause to be happy. Oh, I'm going to... Did you guys hear about Ellen Fleming last week or two weeks ago? Did you hear about this woman whose brokerage, uh, she, she has a, an account with TD Ameritrade, and her broker called Ellen Fleming and reported uh, to her that uh, through the sale of, of a number of different uh, stocks and whatever, her, uh, through the sale of some instruments within her portfolio, a million dollars was deposited into her account. Now, can you imagine if your banker called and said, hey, Paul, by the way, you know what? We sold whatever stocks are in your portfolio, and we just deposited a million dollars. Ten minutes later, her broker called back and profusely apologized. He called the wrong Ellen Fleming. So the first Ellen Fleming, she was told, I have a million dollars. Ten minutes later, she's as broke as she was originally was. A reporter asked her, what was it like? You know what she said? She said, my, I, I, for 10 minutes, for 10 minutes, my life was better. Think about that. Somebody said you got a million bucks, and for 10 minutes she said, my life was better. Was it really better? She never had a million dollars. Did you catch what's going on? In her mind, the thought of, of thinking she was a millionaire, her life was better because she had a million dollars, which she didn't have. My point is this. Does God tell us we're filthy rich? I shouldn't use the word filthy. Are we rich? Do we own a wealthy possession? Blessed hope. God does tell us about our future. And it isn't some smoke screen. It's a real, it's a blessed hope. That's the word happy. We have cause to rejoice. We have a blessed hope. And, and what is this blessed hope? We just read it. One day, he's coming back. And when he comes back, we're going to be caught up together with him. And that's going to be the, initiating, uh, the initiation of the day of Christ. It is called, technically, Ephesians chapter 4. Look there at verse 30. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of what? The day of redemption. 
That has to do with the purchase possession. Real quick, chapter 1, look there at verse 13. Chapter 1, verse 13. In whom ye also trusted after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also ye, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the what? Purchase possession unto the praise of his glory. Glory. We, as a corporate body, as an entity, the church, the body, we are God's purchased possession. How did He buy us? He purchased us with His own what? Blood. The day of redemption is the literal moment in which Jesus Christ descends. He's going to shout the mark, archangel. He's going to cry out the commands to, to, to commence the battle. And there's going to be a trump. The dead rise up first. And then we which are alive. And you know what Paul says? He says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. It's going to happen so instantaneously. That's our hope. That's the day of redemption. That happens at the beginning of the day of Christ. Now, we're going to stop. We're supposed to be talking about the judgment seat of Christ, right? We need to recognize the judgment seat of Christ occurs in that day. It does not occur in the day of the Lord. It does not occur after the seventh week of Daniel. It does not occur at the beginning of the thousand years. And God forbid, it, will not, it is not the great white throne judgment. Okay? So we'll say a few more things about that day. Here's your homework. And I'm really shocked some of you actually do the homework. That's pretty cool. I never did my homework. Anyway, look at every occurrence of the term, specifically the term day of Christ or day of Jesus Christ. Okay? Take a coordinates. Identify every pa the passages in Paul's epistles where Paul talks about the day of Christ or the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? And then next time, you, you, let's, let's determine something. Is it a good thing or a bad thing, okay? And that's what we'll ultimately do. Good thing or a bad thing, and we'll talk more about that, all right? Again, we're, gonna, we're talking about the judgment seat of Christ. Let's just identify when it's going to take place, okay? Father, we do thank you for your grace. We thank you for your love. We thank you for who you've made us in and through your beloved Son, adopted children of Almighty God. We thank you, Lord, for our eternal place and your purpose as we continually delve into the riches of uh, into the wealth of all that you're doing. May, may we, may we in, rejoice. May, may we truly view that hope as a blessed hope, the cause of, of, of happiness, of rejoicing, of joy. We thank you, Father, for uh, the day uh, of, of our Lord Jesus Christ appearing and, and certainly the uh, anticipation of, of being caught up together. And yet may we be serious in understanding we're going to give account, all of us, and we're going to be judged. May we understand what that judgment is about, and may we truly live life in view of that judgment seat of Christ. We pray it now in Christ Jesus' name.